I used to give talks about Iran um, prior to June 12th. Uh, my talks were very different than they are going to be uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, actually, the gist of the talk is the same, but the events that have happened in Iran since the election of uh, June 2009 um, have, have brought Iran back into the news in a way that it hasn't been for a long time. A lot of discussions uh, about Iran, where it's heading, who the, you know, what Iran is. Um, prior to June 12th, we uh, imagined that it was, one of the reasons I wrote the book in the first place was most people in America imagined Iran to be this monolithic place where most people hate America, uh, they support terrorism, uh, they want to destroy the West. Um, they, they're on their way to becoming a nuclear power. And um, this is basically the country. And it's a severe dictatorship um, that imposes its will on the people. Um, post June 12th, we discovered that actually Iranians are human. Um, and they do actually want things that we want. Um, and uh, in a way, it was very good for Western audiences to see Iran on the news every night um, and seeing young people, old people who kind of look like us. Um, maybe the women had a scarf on, but other than that, they basically looked like, like, uh, like us. They wore jeans, they wore t-shirts, um, their slogans were the same, they wanted freedom, they wanted uh, democracy. Um, now that was also a little bit dangerous in terms of the way it was portrayed in the West. A lot of us wanted to put um, a Western look at it through Western eyes. And, and most of our media did that too. Um, we, we, we changed our tune on Iran post um, June 12th. Uh, we suddenly said, well, wait a sec. No, no, Iran is not monolithic. People aren't all um, the way we imagine them to be. In fact, they are like us, so they must want exactly what we have, which is a liberal democracy. Um, and they are starting a revolution. And that revolution means that if we support it, make a big deal out of it, and if they're able to continue it, it's going to mean that they're going to be a country that is going to look like America, is going to be like America, or like the West, and is going to be our friend. They're going to stop nuclear weapons, they're going to um, stop supporting Hamas and Hezbollah. Um, they're just basically going to be a good country as opposed to an evil country. Um, and that was a misinterpretation, in my opinion. When I say in my opinion, um, I don't believe in the expression an Iran expert, even though that's how I'm introduced in a lot of places. I actually belong to the John Stewart School of Iran Experts, which means, which says that no one knows anything about Iran. Um, and uh, he said that a couple of weeks after the election, um, partly because in the news you heard so many contradictory reports about what was going on in Iran, and, and Americans were very confused. We were all confused. Um, the interesting thing is that the Iranians were confused too. And uh, even the leadership is confused um, in Iran. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on the elections. I don't want to make this talk only about the elections and whether Ahmadinejad won the election or didn't win the election. Um, uh, it is my opinion that he did not win the election and he did not win the election by the amount of votes that they claim he won the election. Iran, um, contrary to what most of us believe um, in America, has always had relatively free elections. Um, free elections for parliament, free elections for various governmental, governmental bodies like the Assembly of Experts, um, free elections for the presidency. Um, and despite the fact that some people in the leadership, particularly the Supreme Leader, may have preferred one candidate over another, and has sometimes made that very clear, um, elections have been judged <coughs> to be fair because sometimes the other candidate would win and would be accepted as having won. Um, President Khatami uh, once told me that uh, in the elections, in the presidential elections in Iran, you really can't cheat by more than three or 400,000 votes. Um, and, uh, and when somebody wins by five million votes, that means that the election was fair. Um, the Supreme Leader uh, said that, after June 12th, said, uh, up that figure. He said, well, you can maybe cheat by a million votes, but you can't cheat by 12 million votes which is how much they claimed Ahmadinejad won by. Um, and then a week later, the Guardian Council said, well, maybe 3 million votes, but still, he still won 12 million votes. The number keeps going up. But the reality is that you couldn't, in Iraq, cheat um, up until now. The only way you could cheat was to make up the numbers. Uh, the numbers uh, in which nobody believed would ever happen. 
Iranians actually believed in their uh, uh, election process and uh, believed that the people that they voted for would come into power. And Ahmadinejad, as loathsome as he may appear to be to us, was in fact fairly elected the last time around. I was in Iran and I saw the tremendous amount of support that he had as a man of the people um, for, all, for lots of different reasons why he appealed to the Iranian people as uh, the president. This time around, I was also in Iran and I didn't see the same um, fervor. And uh, the idea that he would win um, by the amount he won, that he would gain 12 million votes over the last time, uh, seems preposterous. Uh, the reason we can't prove that there was a uh, it was a stolen election is because there hasn't been any independent counting um, of the ballots. Um, the reason they can't prove that it wasn't stolen is because there hasn't been any independent counting uh, of the ballots. But there are a lot of statistics that would show, uh, would indicate that the election wasn't fair. What happened in the immediate aftermath was that the opposition candidates um, and many of the Iranian people felt that up until then, the, certainly the most important democratic right that they had, which was to choose their own leader, uh, at least their own president, uh, was taken away from them. This was something that had been guaranteed to them for 30 years, something they had never had, um, partly because we overthrew their democratic system in 1953, um, something that they hadn't had in the time of the Shah, uh, and they were very angry that they felt that this had, been, this had happened. Um, so that's how the, the initial unrest in Iran was really only about a stolen election. Uh, much of the American media and the Western media turned it into something that it wasn't at the time, which was a revolution, a complete rejection of the Islamic system. Now over time, um, the opposition has moved away from it being a stolen election because there's no point trying to change the election results, they're not going to be changed. Um, president Ahmadinejad is ensconced in power as the president. He will be the president for the next three and a half years. And they're looking forward to the future. So what's happened in Iran and what we still see, and what we see on our television screens occasionally, whenever there's a demonstration, whenever there's unrest, whenever the opposition uh, figures speak out, is really a civil rights movement. It's a civil rights movement. It's Iranians looking to gain their civil rights. Um, it's, it's not unlike our civil rights movement, except, of course, it doesn't have a racial uh, connotation, uh, a racial component that ours did. Um, but it is about civil rights right now in Iran, and that's what the opposition is fighting for. That's what the vast majority of Iranians are fighting for, which is a return to their constitution, to what is guaranteed under the Iranian constitution, which is freedom of the press, for example, freedom of assembly, freedom of protest. All the, thing, all the things that are guaranteed in, in, in Iran's own Islamic constitution have been violated. Um, but that doesn't mean that they want to overthrow the system and they want a democracy of the style that we have in America, liberal democracy. Um, most Iranians would reject that. That's not to say there aren't Iranians who do want that, but most Iranians would reject that. Um, it's very curious to watch uh, American analysis of what's going on in Iran and, and to even hear people like Dick Cheney say that uh, we should be supporting the opposition. This is the very same man who wanted to bomb the opposition when he was in power um, because the opposition is not what he imagines it to be, which is a, a group of people who want Iran to look like America, be subservient to America, to, be, to listen to America. Um, and why is that? Why is it that Iran is, is so different? Why is it that it, it, it seems to be this country that is our enemy? It's partly because we make them our enemy. Um, both our government and our media uh, is convenient to have an enemy um, when we don't have a bigger enemy like the Soviet Union anymore. Um, but Iran, the reason Iran wants to be independent and doesn't want to have a system that mirrors our system necessarily, but does want civil rights, does want the same rights that all humans want, is because Iranians have a strong recollection of their own history. Um, they know that they've been a nation state in a region which hasn't had nation states, which there are no, there have been no other nation states in the last hundred years, except for the last hundred years. They've been a nation state for 2,500 years. Um, they were a great empire, and in their own minds, a benevolent empire. Um, they were a nation state that was multi-ethnic um, at a time when in Europe there were city states. Uh, they were a, a country of uh, uh, the rule of law at a time when there wasn't the rule of law in most of the world. They have contributed greatly 
to civilization in their own minds. Um, everything from much of uh, many things in Western civilization have come from Iran. Uh, Iranians are aware. The average Iranian who goes to school and it's a country where it has over 90 percent literacy, um, and most people graduate from high school. Every Iranian who goes to school is aware. For example, a small example, that the post office motto in the United States, that neither snow nor sleep nor um, was Herodotus' description of the Iranian postal system 2,500 years ago. That's a statement that, that's in Herodotus' book um, in describing the Iranian postal system. The Iranians are aware of that history, aware of that culture that they have, aware of, the, um, uh, of, of everything that they've been um, up until now, and they feel that they are looked down upon by the West that their culture, which today includes Shia Islam, is looked down upon by the West, is looked as being threatening to the West, um, as being inferior to the West, that their system of governance is inferior to our system of governance. Um, and this is an arrogant attitude that greater powers have always held about other countries. In Iran's case, Iranians have decided, certainly in the last 30 years, and it was probably true before under the, under the Shah, to no longer care what the West thinks about Iran um, and just to do what they want to do and to be independent. Um, now that is troublesome for the West. Uh, it's troublesome for America. Uh, it's troublesome for Europe. It's troublesome even to some extent for big powers like Russia um, where they want to have other nations, particularly, particularly nations that have natural resources and in this case oil, um, to be in one camp or another. Uh, Iranians don't believe in either or. Um, they sometimes believe in neither. Uh, when George Bush said, uh, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists, or when he said, you're with us or you're against us, well, I was in Iran, the Iranian reaction was, how about neither? Um, and which didn't seem to be an option for America. But the Iranian people, by and large, support their government when I say government, I don't mean Ahmadinejad in particular, but their system of governance, which is something that they invented, which was an alternative to liberal democracy and an alternative to Marxism. At the time of the revolution, those were the two major political systems um, that existed in the world. And Iran said, well, wait a second. Um, what about a third system? What about a system that incorporates um, the best of both, really, but is actually true to what the real Islam is. Um, and that's what we're going to be, because our country has always been an Islamic country. It's always been guided by Islam. Whether the government has been Islamic or not, it has always been guided by Islam, which is very true. Um, under the Shah, many of the laws, many of the rules and regulations in society were Islamic rules and regulations. Um, at the time, we didn't seem to care that a woman under the Shah could not get a passport without the approval of her husband, could not travel without the approval of her husband. It didn't matter because he was our friend. Um, nowadays, we say, well, how horrible is it that under the Islamic Republic, women can't get a passport without the approval of their husband? Um, what's the difference between now and the Shah's time is, there are actually today Ayatollahs um, who are against that and are trying to change those laws. We didn't seem to have a problem under the Shah, when the Shah was our ally, that religious minorities um, didn't have the same rights as Muslims in Iran. We certainly don't seem to have a problem that you can't even be a Jew in Saudi Arabia, and you can't even be a Christian in Saudi Arabia. They don't exist. They're not allowed to exist. Um, we now have a problem with religious minorities in Iran. Why do they not have the same rights as Muslims? Well, that's an argument that Iranians are having as well. The Iranians inside Iran are having the same arguments. There's a Jewish member of parliament, there's a Christian member of parliament, there's a Zoroastrian member of parliament, and they are working to change some of the laws that are actually pre predate the revolution. Um, so my point about that is that we look at Iran through the eyes of the West. We say it's a very different, scary, exotic place, um, and it's incompatible with what we think of as a good civil society. Um, 
The Iranians say, we look at Iran ourselves and think, there are a lot of problems in Iran, but we're going to fix them, and we're going to fix them on our own, and we don't really need someone else to tell us how to fix them or how we should behave. Um, and that's been a continuing problem in the last 30 years. That's not to say that Iran hasn't done things to annoy um, the West or to, uh, to, to counter uh, Western national interests in the region. But that's something that we either have to accept or we have to bomb them. Because these days, um, it's impossible for us to be a power that can dictate to every other power how they're going to behave. They're just not going to put up with it anymore. There was a time when they had to put up with it. Now they're not going to put up with it. And Iran stands as one of the few countries in the world that says it out loud. We are not going to be on your side automatically on every issue. We're not going to follow what you believe is good behavior. Um, it was really interesting when uh, um, President Obama gave his speech, uh, his New Year's greeting to Iran, uh, which was fantastic and which was very well received in Iran, except for the fact that he said, um, we expect you to change your behavior. Um, and uh, a lot of Iranians were like, well, it was all well and good until he said that. Why do we have to change our behavior? What, is, what behavior is he talking about? He wants us to not be Iranian anymore, um, to not be independent anymore, to just do what the United States says. Um, and I think that was a misstep, a small misstep on Obama's part, um, where, although I believe that in general he's been incredibly good in his policy towards um, Iran and the Middle East. Um, the other interesting thing about Iran was um, there was a lot of discussion in the media when President Obama gave his message to the Muslim world. And he gave it from Cairo. And a lot of people actually was in Iran again when he did that. A lot of people were, were asking, well, how did the Iranians react to this? Because uh, clearly his message was meant for Iran as much as for any other country. And many Iranians said, well, it's interesting that he's giving a message in Cairo while there are prisoners, political prisoners, languishing in jails in Cairo. And he's not making any real mention of that. And yet he accuses us of, uh, of, of human rights violations. Um, so, for most Iranians, and this does not mean all Iranians, generalizing about Iranians is, is, is impossible, as it is impossible to generalize about Americans. But for most Iranians, they are comfortable with having a government or having a system, a political system, that reflects their realities, not what we want their realities to be. Um, that doesn't mean that they agree with everything their wacky president says sometimes. Hardly anybody in Iran agrees with his denial of the Holocaust, for example. Um, and he's often criticized inside Iran uh, for his denial of the Holocaust. Very few people in Iran believe, um, as he does, that the Messiah is going to come, the Mahdi, the Muslim Messiah is going to come and take over the world in his lifetime. Very few people believe that. Um, but that doesn't mean that they think that their entire system is, is bad or that their culture is bad, or that even if they do believe in the Messiah, or the eventual, eventual coming of the Messiah, that that's something that should be ridiculed, um, or uh, brought up in the West as something that, that, that makes him automatically, or makes Iran um, an untrustworthy country. Um, so, when I'm talking about the election and what happened in the election, I think it's really important for us in America, um, because Iran is still viewed as an enemy, to put it in the perspective of what it is, what the post-election unrest meant, um, and what it means going forward. People have criticized President Obama for not standing up for democracy in, uh, in Iran, and not standing with the Green Movement, what's called the Green Movement, which is the opposition to the Ahmadinejad government. Um, and he's been criticized from left and right, and he's been criticized by a lot of Iranians, exiles, who live here and are, appear on television, and really want the United States to take an active role um, in trying to help that movement overthrow the government of Ahmadinejad at a minimum, and maybe even overthrow the entire system. Well, you know, if you, the movement itself, the leaders of the movement themselves, um, their most recent slogan, one of the most recent slogans, Mir Hossein Mousavi, who was the leader of the opposition, the man who lost the election uh, to
to Ahmadinejad. His latest slogan was "Na Dolat Kudeta Na Menat Amrika," which means neither a coup d'état government, which he calls the Ahmadinejad government, nor a favor from America. So we're not asking for any favors from America. We can do this on our own. Um, and I have to kind of go back to um, the American civil rights movement or the troubles that we had. I'm old enough, unfortunately, to remember both the civil rights movement and the marches and uh, the protests against the Vietnam War, which was something that America was, uh, that really, you know, was, was a very turbulent time in America. But we would have been very uncomfortable in America, I believe, if other governments, if another government, if the Soviet Union uh, actively did something in the civil rights movement, or if the Soviet Union actively was involved in, in protests, or somehow involved itself in the protests against the Vietnam War. There are certain things, you, know, you have to think of another country, particularly a country like Iran, where I gave that brief uh, historical reference, where Iran feels like it's been this great civilization, this great country, they have a tremendous amount of pride in who they are. Um, they have to feel like they can determine their own destiny, that they don't need the help of anybody else. They don't want the help of anybody else. Um, and when you do offer help, when you do say we have to be on this side or on that side as this great power, you're diminishing who they are. Um, you're insulting them, basically. Um, and that's why the opposition in Iran has not asked for help. From, from America has not asked for it. They, they ask for solidarity, which is fine. They ask for a condemnation of human rights abuses, which is fine. But they don't ask for help. They don't ask for anything. Um, they feel that Iran, Iranians themselves can, can do what they need to do uh, to bring about a better civil society in Iran. They're well aware of what needs to be done. They're well aware of the drawbacks of the Islamic system of government the way it's set up right now. Um, they're well aware that there are many institutions in Iran that allow for change in Iran. There are ayatollahs. The reason I titled the book The Ayatollah Begs to Differ, my last book, was because this idea that all the ayatollahs agree all the time, that this monolithic political structure is incorrect. You have ayatollahs, you have mullahs, you have politicians who disagree all the time. Um, you have people who are constantly discussing what they disagree about in Iran openly. There are moments in Iranian history, um, recent history, where the freedom, freedom of the press is curtailed and freedom of expression is curtailed. But up until now, those moments have been temporary. It's bounced back. There have been limits on, on the freedom of the press. Right now happens to be a very bad moment. But I would argue that we, uh, we contribute to that. Um, the government of Iran, the leadership of Iran, um, and I talk to them, I know some of them, are very paranoid, rightly or wrongly. I would argue that in some cases, rightly. Um, George Bush authorized $400 million for regime change in Iran, for covert action in Iran. Uh, constantly talking about regime change, constantly talking about all options being on the table, and President Obama has continued that, and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has been even more hawkish on whether we might bomb Iran or not. Well, put yourself in the position of the Iranian government you start getting a little paranoid. Um, you've got the American military in the Persian Gulf. You've got the Army, the U.S. Army in, in, in Afghanistan. You've got the U.S. Army in Iraq. Um, you've got Israel and the United States threatening to bomb you and, and to destroy your regime. Well, you're naturally going to react badly to that. And react badly to that is to basically clamp down on civil rights. Um, somehow, some, in some ways, in the same way that we clamped down on civil rights when we felt threatened by Al-Qaeda post 9-11. I felt that civil rights were being diminished in the United States after 9-11. I still think that they were diminished. Um, and it's because of fear. It was because of fear. Um, and the same is true in Iran. So in Iran, when they say that this was all, this unrest is planned by the, by the Americans, um, the demonstrations and the riots and, and this and that, it's all, it's all Western plot to overthrow the system, overthrow the Islamic system through a velvet revolution or a color revolution. You can understand why from their perspective. I can understand why they think that. I don't happen to believe that we're using the, the opposition in Iran to overthrow the system. I don't happen to believe that, that the CIA is smart enough to do that. Um, but I think that uh, you look at it from the perspective
perspective of, of the Iranian leadership and the paranoia that they have, the insecurity that they have, has been partly responsible for, which we have fed, has been partly responsible for the way they have reacted. In general, the Iranian government has been very lax um, in all kinds of uh, uh, issues um, whenever it's not felt threatened. Um, and when it has felt threatened, it's been in very severe. Um, just today, just today, the Israeli chief of staff of the army um, gave a uh, uh, speech to the Knesset arguing that uh, Israel is getting prepared, is preparing to bomb Iran, to attack Iran. Well, that's not very helpful as far as I'm concerned um, because there are a number of reasons why that's not helpful and not just because you feed the paranoia of the, uh, the Iranian government, um, but also because we then judge things that happen in Iran. In Iran in, 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 we can misjudge things that happen in Iran. Um, you know, and in, in September when it was announced, this grand announcement that Iran had built a nuclear um, enrichment facility underground, protected by the Revolutionary Guards, um, fortified with concrete. We were all like, well, that's obvious. They're doing it in secret and they're doing it um, somewhere very protected because they want to build a bomb. Well, the Iranians in an inside Iran said, well, no, we're doing this and the people of Iran believe their government. We're doing it because you're constantly threatening to bomb our nuclear facility. So well, where else are we going to build a nuclear facility? Um, and my argument has been, and every time I've been invited to Washington, my argument is if you take that option off the table, if you start saying, we will never bomb you, we have no reason to bomb you. We will not bomb you. We are taking that option off the table. We will not go to war with you unless you first go to war with us. Uh, only in defense will we go to war. Then you take away a lot of excuses from a government like Iran's. Um, you take away many of their excuses. First, their excuses to have a secret enrichment facility. Their excuse to clamp down on civil liberties because they feel threatened. They feel threatened they'll be bombed in combination with a revolution. If we make it our policy to not institute regime change in Iran, which we still haven't done, still to this day we have not said it is not our policy to institute regime change in Iran, then we take away a lot of those excuses and you make people feel more comfortable. Iranians by and large, um, when you travel around the country, uh, find it very hard to believe that they as a people, and even their government, even the government that we think is wacky and crazy and wants to destroy the West, um, has any ambitions to do anything to anybody, has any offensive ambitions at all. Um, whenever I'm in Iran with an American colleague, a writer, a reporter, and uh, people immediately can recognize that the person's American, and the first thing they ask, the first thing they ask them um, is, they say to me, can you ask her or can you ask him if all Americans believe we're all terrorists? That's the first thing they say. Um, because that's the in, in, in impression that Iranian, the Iranian people have of how we view them, that they're all terrorists, their government's terrorists. They may not like their government in some cases. In many cases, they, they may not like the particular president and the particular administration that's in power. But that doesn't mean that they necessarily um, don't like what the government represents, that their entire system. We didn't like George Bush, but we didn't want to tear up the Constitution. Um, we didn't like uh, Richard Nixon, but we didn't want to tear up the Constitution. In fact, we wanted to apply the Constitution and impeach him. Um, and the same is true in Iran. There are people in Iran who want even the Supreme Leader to be impeached. And there is a mechanism for that. Um, Iran has a political structure that many people think is very opaque, partly because they can't be bothered to look into it. Um, it all sounds very Orwellian, you know, the Assembly of Experts, the Supreme National Security Council, the Guardian Council. Um, well, in Farsi, they don't sound as Orwellian, mainly because <laughs> Orwell didn't write in Farsi. Um, but <laughs> but uh, it's not as Orwellian. Well, we have a Supreme Court. We have a Supreme Court that decided the election in 2000. I don't think anybody doubts that in America, including Republicans. Um, and decided, and it was an unelected body. We talk about unelected bodies all the time in Iran. Well, Iran's not a democracy because an unelected body does this, an unelected body does that. Well, our Supreme Court's an unelected body. I'm sorry, we elect the president who can then appoint the Supreme Court. Well, in Iran, the Supreme Leader is unelected, correct. He is an unelected Supreme Leader, and they don't call him Supreme for nothing, by the way. He is the ultimate authority in Iran. Um, but he is elected by the Assembly of Experts, that Orwellian term. The Assembly of Experts is elected by the people. Um, in Iran, you vote, I voted in the 
the Assembly of Experts. You decide who you want to be on the Assembly of Experts, who will decide who the Supreme Leader is and has the ability to impeach the Supreme Leader if and when they feel it necessary. Um, one of the things very few people know is that in the post-election uh, crisis in Iran, the chairman of the Assembly of Experts, who's Ayatollah Rafsanjani, um, did actually go out and try to see if he had the votes to impeach um, the Supreme Leader, because the Supreme Leader, for the very first time, had um, taken sides in a very overt way, which was not really his role. It's not even his role in the, under the Constitution. Um, we are not sure what happened in those meetings that he had, because they're secret, but um, we have to assume that he did not have the votes to impeach the Supreme Leader. Um, and in the same way that we sometimes, are, the way our government works, and they sometimes think about the greater good, um, the, the stability of the nation, uh, it is my feeling that they probably felt the various members of the Assembly of Experts who have, who are made up of, like many governmental bodies everywhere in the world, are made up of people from far left, far right, middle, pragmatic people. Um, they probably felt that it was probably not in the interest of the nation to trigger another crisis by having the Supreme Leader removed as well. They probably felt that they could weather this crisis and deal with the issues that they had to deal with later. Um, and Ayatollah Rafsanjani is continuing uh, to deal with those issues and continue to um, be in somewhat of the opposition to the President, um, which is good for the future of Iranian democracy. Um, nothing could be better for America than to allow Iran to develop over time into being the kind of democracy that they want to be. Um, you know, if they don't want Starbucks and McDonald's, fine. But, uh, well, they actually do want Starbucks and McDonald's. They have fake Starbucks and McDonald's. What they don't really want in their society are some of the things that we have, which is some of the Hollywood exports that we like to send out to the world. Um, the culture doesn't want it. Um, and they probably won't want it for, for, for the foreseeable future because it's a, um, a deeply religious culture uh, at this time. But they also, the, Iran has had a long history of having had democratic moments, um, going back all the way to the 19th century. Um, and their first constitution in, in, in 1906, Iran was still a monarchy, but it had a constitution uh, created in 1906. And in fact, there was a, um, a constitutional revolution at the time, because the Shah didn't want a constitution. And um, an American, there's an American hero, there's, there's a John Reed of Iran. John Reed was the, the American who fought on the side of, uh, um, with Lenin in the Russian Revolution, um, made famous by Mark Beatty um, in the movie Reds. But there was a John Reed of Iran, his name is Howard Baskerville, and uh, there's a statue of him in Iran. He was killed in the Constitutional Revolution, fighting on the side of the, 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 the Democrats who were fighting against the Shah's forces. Uh, and today, to this day, he's a hero in Iran. Um, every year people go visit his grave, they put uh, flowers on his grave, um, and even the Islamic government, even the most anti-American um, mullahs in Iran, the most anti-American uh, government officials, respect Abu Baskerville as being a champion of democracy in Iran. Um, there was another American hero, uh, um, uh, William Morgan Schuster, who was uh, appointed treasurer general of Iran, um, who was forced out by the uh, English and the Russians at the time, who were the, the dominant powers. Um, it, uh, it, Persia was a client state either of Russia or Great Britain, and Great Britain and Russia fought over Persia all the time. It was never colonized, but, was, um, but they didn't like the idea of America, this, this country that was uh, at that point not a colonial power, um, that really did want to uh, um, do good in the world when it could. Uh, and they, 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 they managed to get the shot and kick him out. Um, and he was putting Iran's finances together, and one of the things he was doing was taking away a lot of the, uh, um, the financial benefits that Russia and Great Britain had by exploiting Iran at the time, everything from tobacco to oil. Um, so Iran's history with America was good, was good until 1953. In fact, it was very good until 1953. And Iranians, you know, a lot is made of, a lot is made in the, in the media of, oh, Iranians are still really upset about 1953, um, and that's why they hate Americans. The fact that we had a democracy and, and America came in and overthrew that democracy and re 
put the Shah in and, and trained his secret police and so on and so forth. Well, yes, Iranians don't like that and are upset about that and feel that that history is a bad history. But they also remember Howard Baskerville. They also remember William Morgan Schuster. They also like the American people. Generally, they like what America stands for. There is not one Iranian, including in the leadership that I have ever met, who has said that he, he or she is fundamentally opposed to America and to the concept of America. In fact, there are many things they admire about America. What they don't like is interference. Um, it reminds them of Great Britain and Russia interfering in their affairs. Um, and every Iranian student learns all this history when they're in school, they, including the history of the Constitutional Revolution, including Howard Baskerville, an American hero for Iranians. They learn all this history. So there's a lot for us to work from when we're dealing with Iran. Um, but the way we work with Iran right now has not been productive. Um, and we don't really try to understand, and this may not be our jobs, I mean, most of the average American can say, well, why do I need to understand Iranians? You know, what's, I mean, it's another country, I mean, there's a million, there's 198, well, however many countries there are in the world, I can't know every country, I can't know every culture, fair enough. But we're told by our government that this is our enemy. We're told by our government that this is a country that wants to, um, you know, um, not just stand up to us, but actually uh, uh, counter our national security interests. Um, and therefore, we have to make certain decisions that will affect every one of us, whether it's a decision to impose greater sanctions on Iran um, and keep sanctioning it to death, uh, which won't work. And I think the government of the United States knows that sanctions don't necessarily work. They have to work for 30 years. There's no reason to believe that they're going to work now. Um, or we have to take military action. Um, and we don't seem to have any other option right now. Um, so that does affect us. It affects us because if we take military action, then it, it affects everybody. Um, not just our troops who may get involved, if they get involved, um, but they, the Iranians will make sure they get involved even if we never land any troops in, in, in Iran. Um, because we have troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, and in the Persian Gulf, we have sailors in the Persian Gulf. And um, it affects us economically. So we should know whether our government is doing the right thing or the right or the wrong thing in its dealings with Iran. A big question for a lot of Americans is should I be scared, as Amber was saying, should I be scared of the Iranians? Should I be scared of their nuclear program? Well, I think anytime anybody has a nuclear program that could potentially build bombs is scary, including when America has it. Um, and you know, the idea that uh, some people in America had put forth at some point during the nuclear crisis under the Bush administration that we would actually use nukes to destroy Iranian nukes uh, or Iranian uh, nuclear facilities uh, was incredibly frightening to, to, to many people, including um, obviously the Iranians who would be affected most by it. Um, but I, so I think, yes, nuclear weapons are scary wherever they are. And it really doesn't matter wherever they are. Certainly, they're certainly scary in Pakistan. Um, we don't seem to be talking about that too much because uh, Pakistan doesn't have a leader who goes you know, running off his mouth at the United Nations about you know, the Holocaust and wiping like, Israel off the map. Um, so it's less concerning. Uh, it's also, we happen to know that the Pakistani nukes are aimed at New Delhi, uh, which is not, which is the wrong direction from the United States. Um, so, and whereas Iranian nukes, we assume, will be, will be uh, directed westward. First at Israel, which is our closest ally, and then maybe Western Europe. Well, I mean, that's a fantasy. The Iranians aren't, uh, aren't lunatics. Um, they, uh, they may have some strange ideas, they may have some strange customs, um, as far as we're concerned. But I have yet to meet a suicidal mullah. Um, and um, that's not to say that there haven't been suicidal Muslims, but I have yet to meet a suicidal mullah. Um, in fact, they quite like their lifestyle, and they quite like to, uh, to, to, to enjoy that lifestyle um, well into their um, uh, older years. Um, and they understand very well, the conversations I have, they understand very well that if they were ever to have nuclear weapons, if they were ever to use those nuclear weapons, um, then they would be destroyed themselves. And uh, not only would they, they be destroyed, their country would be destroyed, their system of government, what they think um, this incredible, great, new, independent Persia that they've created would be destroyed. Um, their legacy would be destroyed. They understand that. Um, so. They have, at this point, uh, my belief is that they have no intentions of building a bomb 
at this point. Now, we can guarantee that they will build a bomb if we attack them. That's one way to guarantee that they will build a nuclear weapon. Uh, they have the technology. The only way we can take that technology away from them is by killing every single scientist they have. Um, and uh, that's going to be hard. Uh, we have good, good assassination teams, but I don't know if we're that good to get every single um, scientist that they have who's uh, ever worked on uh, nuclear technology. Um, basically, when a country has, the nu has nuclear technology, they can go to a bomb. The biggest problem with building a bomb is the fuel required for it, and that's where our big concern is. Our big concern is the fact that they're enriching uranium means that they can build a bomb. And the Iranian response to that is, and this is not just the leadership, the Iranian people agree with their leadership on this, by and large they do, is that it's not our fault that if you have the technology to have the fuel, you can also have the technology to build a bomb. You're just inferring that because we have the technology that we will then build a bomb. Um, the reason Iranians insist on enrichment and their propaganda has been very good to their own people and the people that bought into this is that they don't trust the West. We don't trust Iran. We tell them we don't trust them and they say, okay, well, we don't trust you either. We have reasons not to trust you. You have very few reasons not to trust us, except for that tiny episode where we took your diplomats hostage. Other than that, you have, you have absolutely no other reason to not trust us. Um, which is basically true. Iran has been pretty open about um, everything it has done, including its support for Hezbollah and Hamas, which is something we don't like, but they've been open about it. They haven't hidden their support for Hamas and, and Hezbollah. Um, but again, except for the hostage crisis, they don't believe they've done anything to, to, um, uh, to not be a trustworthy uh, partner for anybody. They believe the West has been untrustworthy because prior to the revolution, in Iran, um, Iran had contracts for many things, including nuclear power plants, which it paid for in some instances. And governments such as France um, just decided after the revolution, well, we don't really like the new government, so we're not going to deliver the contract. Um, well, Iran said, well, give us our money back. Well, we're not going to do that either. Um, so there's like $4 billion of Iranian money sitting in France, um, earning interest, we presume, um, that they've never paid. And uh, so when it was proposed recently that France be the country that uh, delivered back the uranium that Iran sends to them for them to enrich for medical isotopes, Iran's first reaction was, we don't trust France. You know, we had contracts with them before and they just decided they didn't want to do it. But Iran's position on enrichment is a very simple one and, and it's one that all Iranians, well, say all, most Iranians agree with, is that why should Iran be dependent on foreign sources of energy. It's the same position that President Obama had in his campaign, that we should reduce America's dependence on foreign sources of oil, on foreign sources of energy. And Iran has the same position. Oil is going to run out of Iran, 20 to 25 years. So the argument that Iran's sitting on a sea of oil, it doesn't need nuclear energy, it can just use its own oil, that argument doesn't wash. Iran doesn't think in 20 year terms, it thinks in terms of long, in long term. In the way that every country should, every rational country can't think, well, I'm just going to use all the oil until it runs out, and then I'll worry about energy later. They're saying, okay, how are we going to produce energy for this country? A growing population, growing economy. They look at France, for example, back to France. They say 60% of France's power comes from nuclear energy. Um, why shouldn't we have 60% of our power, 70% of our power coming from nuclear energy? It's clean, it's efficient. It's, these days, it's quite safe, especially if it's not Russian. Uh, even though the Russians are building the one in Iran because no one else will. Uh, I think it would be much better for us if we were building it for them um, and much safer for us given that the power plant that the Russians are building is very close to our fifth fleet and if anything goes wrong, a lot of our sailors are going to be affected by it. Um, so their attitude is that why shouldn't we have that source of energy? Now the question comes, well, what we're saying, what the West is saying to Iran is, um, oh yeah, yeah, you can have nuclear energy but uh, you can't have the fuel. Because if you have the fuel, it also means if you decide to build a bomb, then you can build a bomb. So we'll supply you with fuel. Just trust us. We'll supply you with it. Well, Iran says, first of all, we don't trust you. And why don't we trust you? Because we will no longer be independent against a superpower like America if we have to rely on our energy coming from American or American uh, influence sources. Why? Because anytime we want to stand up 
for our own rights, or we want to take a position on the world stage, whatever that position is, being anti-Israel, being anti-this, or pro-that, you can hold that over our heads and say, well, no, we don't like what you just said. Either change that, or we're not going to deliver you the fuel, the nuclear fuel. Um, since Iran knows how oil can be used as a weapon against the West, they don't want the West to be able to use energy against them. So this is a very complicated issue, and it's, it's complicated how it's going to be solved. I'm not sure how it's going to be solved. But the important thing to remember is that the Iranian people generally support their government when it comes to the nuclear The entire opposition supports the government. Um, it's not that they support President Ahmadinejad, it's not that they support his rhetoric, it's not that they support many of his policies, but they support the idea of Iran being independent uh, in, its, in its energy, of being able to be an independent nation, being able to be, um, to be able to stand up for its own rights and for whatever rights it decides to stand up for without fear of being pressured by the United States or by any other power into doing something they don't want. I mean, an Iranian ambassador once said to be right after um, the UN Security Council voted on one of the uh, resolutions against Iran because it wouldn't stop uranium enrichment. And Iran thought they had South Africa um, on their side. And afterwards, he went up to the South African ambassador and he said, well, what happened? The South Africa voted with America. And the South African ambassador just shook his head. He said, you know, pressure from America. We couldn't, we, we couldn't hold out the pressure from America. Even though South Africa had assured Iran that they actually were on Iran's side, they believed Iran shouldn't be sanctioned for enriching uranium. That's a position that Iranians don't want to be in. They don't want to ever be in a position where they're forced to do something that they don't really want to do because we, the great power, have that ability to hold something over them, to hold them to ransom and, um, if, we, if we need to. Um, and uh, uh, that's something that has the, has the support of, of most Iranians who, again, as I said, have, have this long history, um, have a great deal of pride uh, in, in their culture, in who they are, um, where they should stand in the world. Um, up until 1979, most people, I wouldn't be able to give this talk anymore prior to 1979, not because Iran wasn't interesting, but because nobody gave a damn about Iran. Um, you know, it'd be very hard to give this talk today about a country that is our ally somewhere, you know, in the Middle East or somewhere in, uh, in Africa, because most people, we don't read about those countries, and, you know, we're not that interested. Well, they're allies, fine, whatever, you know. Um, Iranians are proud of that. Even though we have a reputation that is largely bad, we actually like the idea that we even have a reputation now. Um, we didn't have one for so many generations and generations, and that, that showed weakness and showed irrelevance on the world stage. So Iranians like that we're relevant. They like that we have power. They like that, uh, that, that we're important, that people are curious about who we are and why we behave the way we behave, including our government. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very hard thing for Iranians to understand why America, in particular the American government, looks at them as the enemy. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm very hopeful uh, under the Obama administration that that's going to change. Um, but the Iranian government certainly has reason when it says, um, we have only heard, you know, as the screen leader said, you know, Mr. Obama speaks beautifully, you know, he gives beautiful speeches, he says wonderful things, but we'd like to see something. We'd like to see some change, uh, and they haven't seen that change. I believe that he's mistaken, that America has changed, that President Obama has changed our policy towards Iran. Um, but they're right in Iran when we haven't changed our policy in, in, in terms of um, a certain aggressiveness and talking about uh, um, deterring Iran or we will not allow Iran ever under any circumstance to uh, build, uh, to be capable of building a nuclear weapon. Things like that, like that, like that, make Iranians go, well, you know. So it's the same old story. It's not, it's not that different. Um, you know, nicer words, but they're still talking about bombing us if we continue on the path we're going. So they're going to say sanctions first. If those don't work, uh, so what are the bombs going to fall? Um, and uh, I, I don't think that's helpful. I think that Iran, it's unlikely that Iran uh, will be an enemy of the United States if we decide that it's not. Iranian people have very, very little, uh, have, have 
no bone to pick with America on virtually anything uh, except the fact that they're constantly being threatened with regime change and uh, destabilization and the fact that they're not allowed to do this and not allowed to do that, they have to behave this way or that way. If those things are removed, um, Iran and America actually have a lot in common. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about if you look at the people of Iran who were demonstrating and if you, if you saw them uh, on the street, you, you could see that they're, they're not that different. They're not, uh, they're just, they have the same aspirations, uh, generally speaking, than most people do. This, this very election that I'm talking about um, was mostly about the economy. And guess what? That's what most elections are about. Most people vote their pocketbook in the United States, in Western Europe. It's true also in Iran. They weren't voting for a president who doesn't say the Holocaust happened or who does say the Holocaust happened. They weren't voting on foreign policy. They weren't voting on relations with America. They were voting because the economy was bad. That's the reason they came out in big numbers. Um, incredibly bad. I mean, I was there during the campaigns and um, uh, I've talked to a lot of different people from different walks of life. And that was the number one issue. The economy was the number one issue. Um, which is why I feel that Ahmadinejad, who was blamed for a bad economy, um, was not going to win the election, or at least not win it the way um, he did. Foreign policy, which is important to us, only came into the picture mostly because of economics. Uh, the opposition was able to portray Ahmadinejad as having his foreign policy as having had a negative effect on the economy, which is true, because under the previous president, under Khatami, um, where there were less threats against Iran, and where his rhetoric wasn't quite as belligerent as Ahmadinejad, it was much more difficult for the United States to get a consensus in the world to apply sanctions. Sanctions have hurt the economy. There is no question about it. Sanctions do hurt the economy. Um, and that was the tone in the, in the campaign against Ahmadinejad. The opposition leaders were saying, well, it's not that we disagree with Iran's foreign policy. It's that this tone has enabled um, America to convince other countries, it's enabled Israel to convince other countries to apply sanctions and to continue to apply sanctions, banking sanctions. It's very hard for Iranian businesses to get letters of credit, for example. Uh, so there's, a, uh, there's hardly any foreign investment. There's very little domestic investment in the economy these days because it's very hard uh, with all the sanctions. Um, so the primary focus for Iranians, the average Iranian in the election, was the economy. Um, and uh, that's true everywhere in the world. Now, when it comes to civil liberties and, and those kinds of things, the assumption was that uh, the next president, the ones who were voting for the reformists, was that there was going to be uh, a, you know, um, a loosening of uh, the restrictions that, that, that had come under the Ahmadinejad government and there would be a more open society. And so certainly there were many Iranians who were voting for uh, Ahmadinejad's opponents because they felt that Ahmadinejad um, was, uh, was uh, not the kind of uh, president that they felt uh, represented uh, what, what the Iranian people wanted. But I always compared Ahmadinejad to George Bush, I still do. Um, and uh, George Bush unfortunately got two terms, in, uh, in my mind anyway. And uh, Ahmadinejad has, uh, I hope my group, had his two terms. Um, I think what's happening in Iran in some ways, um, in some ways is better than what happened here after George Bush was re-elected in that uh, we have uh, an opposition that's far more vibrant and far more active against Ahmadinejad and will have far more influence on him and the hardliners who support him than our opposition, which was the Democratic Party, had against George Bush in his second term. Um, so uh, that's all good news as far as I'm concerned. Um, and in the longer term, uh, Iran, I think, is, is you know, what happened in the election may have been, in fact, one of the best things to happen for Iran because it brought forth um, many of the issues that had been bubbling and been under the surface. If uh, President uh, Ahmadinejad had lost the election and Mousavi had won, um, there would have been cheering on the streets of Tehran, I'm convinced of that. Um, and there may have been some cheering in America saying, well, that team is much better than uh, uh, Ahmadinejad. This team is much more reasonable and uh, much more progressive. But the reality is we would have been very disappointed in America um, because he would have continued the same foreign policy. He would not have bowed to America the way we'd like him to bow. Um, and when President Obama was criticized for saying, as far as he was concerned, there was no difference between Ahmadinejad and Musavi, um, I actually agreed with him. Because as far as President Obama was concerned, there was no difference. There was
was no reason to believe that Wasabi was suddenly going to, you know, lie down and say, okay, whatever America wants, it's no problem. Um, so as far as he was concerned, he was going to be dealing with a foreign policy that was already set. Um, and uh, uh, what happened in the election, and, and the fact that Iranians came out and, and, and started the civil rights movement means that civil rights movements are generally successful when they have, um, when they have the support, a large support of the people. It doesn't mean that uh, Iran is going to become a liberal democracy and is going to become uh, you know, a, a servant of the United States. Far from it, but it means that for the Iranian people, there will be a better society in the long term, a more democratic society, because that's what they want. Um, but within the constraints of their own culture, within their own, um, uh, yeah, really, really within their own culture. So I think I've talked for way longer than I was supposed to, but. Um,